Left thoroughly destitute as a condition of Sulla's pardon, and needing to earn fast money, Caesar enlisted in the legions. It was time to begin his career. Additionally, Caesar wanted to put as much distance between himself and the changeable dictator as possible. Though the years he had spent in the Flaminate had left Caesar behind others his age, his rank as a patrician meant he could enlist as a junior officer. But whom to serve? The renegade Marians who had escaped Sulla's wrath in Rome were busy trying to rebuild their armies in the provinces. Famed general, and high-ranking Marian, Quintus Sertorius had fled to Hispania. There, the renegade commander was busy stripping Rome of the province which produced most of Rome's silver. Marcus Perperna Vento, another Marian senator, had taken Sicily. From there, Vento offered refuge to any Marians who escaped Sulla's prescriptions. Nius Domitius Enobarbus, who was married to Senilla's sister, had forced his way into the Roman province of North Africa. There, he attempted to conscript legions from among the settled colonies of Gaius Marius. Knowing full well he would long be closely watched by Sulla, Caesar decided to make it easy for the dictator to keep an eye on him, and impossible for him to be accused of aiding any renegade generals. Ignoring all the provinces with Marian activity, Caesar, instead, got assigned as a military tribune to one of Sulla's top generals. Before leaving the city, Caesar's financial situation forced him to move his mother and wife into Rome's overpopulated Sabura. The Sabura was tucked discreetly behind the large hill upon which topped Jupiter's temple. The huge temple hid the Sabura from the view of the lofty villas that dotted Rome's most illustrious neighborhood, Clivus Palatinus, or Palatine Hill. Caesar's new neighborhood was poverty-stricken, rampant with crime, and bursting at the seams with overcrowded tenement apartments rising as high as five stories. These tenements were made of wood and other cheap materials, and often collapsed if they didn't simply burst into flames. But, stripped of his family's fortunes, Caesar was left with no alternatives. Traveling to Asia, where Caesar's father had once been pro praetor, Caesar joined the army of Marcus Minucius Thermus. Thermus, who had lost his army to the machinations of the dissident, Fimbria, had been among those to abandon the Marian cause, and defect to Sulla. Thermus was in the process of fighting the massive pirate problem which troubled the seas. For Caesar, fighting against pirates was the safest political choice. No one could accuse him of fighting for the Marians, but neither could he be accused of fighting against them. On the island of Lesbos, the town of Mytilene was in open revolt against Rome and, Thermus suspected, in the pay of the Aegean's pirate guilds to do so. Thermus, coordinating with another of Sulla's young generals, Lucullus, laid siege to Mytilene, and offered Caesar his first opportunity for battle. This nephew of Gaius Marius, who may have learned the arts of war at his uncle's feet, distinguished himself well enough to be awarded the Corona Civica, civic crown. Falling just below the grass crown in terms of importance, the civic crown was the second highest crown which could be awarded to a Roman citizen. The Corona Civica was presented to a citizen who had saved the lives of other citizens by slaying an enemy on a spot that had been previously held by the enemy on the same day. The citizens who were saved were the only people who could award the civic crown, and after the siege of Mytilene, they awarded it to Gaius Julius Caesar. Under Sulla's constitutional reforms, the winning of a military crown came with immediate, and lifelong membership in the Senate. At only 19 years old, Caesar was now a senator. Sulla's reforms also paid homage to Rome's military successes by insisting winners of military crowns wear them whenever appearing in a public capacity. And, gathered crowds were obliged to stand and applaud any wearer of a military crown. By law, Caesar could now look forward to a lifetime of applause every time he entered the Senate. Because Caesar acquitted himself well during the siege, he rose in Thermus's esteem despite the commander's suspicion that Caesar was a secret Marian. Next, Thermus assigned Caesar, whose name was far more illustrious than his own, a diplomatic mission to the Kingdom of Bithynia. Caesar's objective was to extract from King Nicomedes IV, a fleet of ships for Thermus. Though Sulla had defeated Pontus's king Mithridates, and forced the aggressor king to sue for peace, trouble was brewing in the eastern provinces within the first year of Sulla's return to Rome. 
Another war was coming, and Thermus needed that fleet in place against the eventuality of another attack by Mithridates. Caught is a small country that divided Pontus from Rome's eastern provinces, Bithynia stood to be trampled again by Mithridates' next attempt, and Caesar's duty was to remind the aged Nicomedes that Rome's support was always transactional. Caesar could not leave Bithynia without that fleet.